All right, welcome back to the Vidmark podcast. I'm very excited. We're going to be doing a book analysis today of one very iconic book, and that is The Purple Cow by uh, Seth Godin. And, um, you know, this is a small book. It's almost pocket size, definitely stands out on the shelf because it's purple, and it's got a memorable title, Purple Cow. So I think I was recommended this book by a, a marketing professional many years ago. I'm glad I finally had the opportunity to read it. Um, it's a Seth Godin book, which if you're going to be talking about marketing, you definitely got to reference Seth Godin. He's a, uh, a legend or a, a goat or a Seth Goatin. Sorry. And these are my puns for the morning. <laughs> This is actually probably the earliest I've been doing a podcast. It's about 7.30 a.m., but I got a big day ahead of me, so I decided to record it at the beginning of the day. But Seth Godin, he's the guy with uh, the glasses. Uh, He's got an iconic look himself. This book was published in 2003, and a lot of the references are in 2002. And I, you know, it's like any of these marketing books. Things change. A lot of the uh, tools and ways that practices that we go about things change, but uh, at the end of the day, some of those core, you know, things that are at the heart of your business that are going to help you grow and develop your brand still ring true. So we're going to be dissecting a lot of those today. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's cue the intro. Welcome to Vidmark, a podcast to give you the video marketing knowledge to always hit the mark. Let us help build your confidence with video strategy and content creation best practices. Join us weekly for pro tips and guest interviews as we explore the powerful communication tool of video. It's time to boost your business. Let's talk video. All right, welcome back. So Seth Godin has a very fun writing style. Uh, Makes it really enjoyable to read. It's very short, concise and uh, just kind of gets right to the point, doesn't add a lot of extra fluff, which I really enjoyed. I think the book is about like 137 pages, and it's a pretty small font, but uh, I made my way through it, and I'm pretty happy with my progress. But um, yeah, I would say the main core things, I'm going to go into like kind of the two big nuggets that if you're not going to listen to any other part of this podcast, these are the big two takeaways, is um, if anything, be remarkable. That's kind of one of the big things that Seth Godin says throughout his book. Um, in fact, I think he actually signs the beginning part of this. Yeah, always choose remarkable. Um, and so essentially at the end of the day, if you're not being remarkable, then you're invisible. And when you don't take risks, when you don't stand out from the crowd, uh, your business is going to suffer. So if you want to survive, you want to be around for a long time, you have to do something innovative. You have to be unique, which is something we've talked about on this podcast quite a bit. The other thing is you're probably wondering, well, what's the purple cow? Well, I'll give it to you right away. The purple cow is pretty much regular cows are quite boring. Um, I think he uses a story of, I think he was in France or he was someplace where Cows are pretty adorable, and they enjoyed them at first when they were going on their drive, and then as they kept going along, they're like, okay, just another cow, and you know, they're not doing backflips or anything. They're just grazing in the countryside, but he said that a purple cow would be interesting and would really stand out, but like anything, um, it eventually would uh, maybe fizzle out unless it does something that makes it truly remarkable, like maybe a talking cow that's also purple, but... So that's kind of the fun aspect about the purple cow. How can you stand out from the crowd? How can you not just be another cow? How can you not just be vanilla? Um, Can you be this extravagant color or this extravagant flavor or genre that helps you stand out and allows people to recognize you for something more than just the mundane? And it's cool because he talks about some different markets such as like salt or plumbing that wouldn't never necessarily be very exciting, but they're still necessary things. And so how do you create an experience that's going to be exciting for people? Uh, I didn't know this going into the book, but he talks about the P's of marketing. I guess that was, that was a pretty popular phrase was, um, you know, product, pricing, promotion, packaging, publicity, all of these things are the, the P's of marketing essentially. And um, they, I guess the old mantra used to be, if you could dial those in, then you could uh, be a successful marketer. Um, so, you know, we talked about being different. Uh, how can you do that? And then also 
not only you know making your organization different, but what are the platforms that you're using to get your message out there that are different? Because a lot of them are being used. Television is heavily used. Um, you know, print, uh, billboards, all of these are uh, being heavily used. So how can you stand out? Uh, hence, this this podcast is one example of standing out. Uh, TikTok, LinkedIn, getting on some of these platforms that are up and coming. That's a good way of standing out. And we've talked about in the podcast before, being first has a lot of benefits. And then they go through the history of advertising, which used to be word of mouth. Um, and now we have these very intricate networks online. And uh, it's kind of funny. He talks about, I, I forget what the old adage is like, you know, that's as cool as sliced bread. And then he actually talks about the original invention of sliced bread didn't catch on at first and it wasn't until 20 years later where it got kind of repackaged by wonder bread and they actually talked about in a way that it builds strong bodies 12 different ways because there's 12 slices of bread so i thought that was pretty interesting and just to give you guys a heads up we have about six pages of notes i just made it through kind of the first page there so um this will be i imagine this will be about a 30 40 minute uh podcast so uh, lots of things to unpack here. I'm excited to share this with you guys. Um, and so the next thing he talks about is uh, the explanation of how larger companies actually, as they get bigger, start to play it safe and they hang on to the things that used to work and they stop innovating and they stop allowing you know passionate people to take hold and um, you know get traction and try to get attention which you see often. Um, so that's some of the advantages of being a smaller company. You can try to be innovative. You can be take more risks. Um, you know, he talks about, then at the next point, he talks about the different types of customers who are going to be paying attention to your company if you take risks. Um, you have your prospects, you have your customers, you have loyal customers, and you have former customers. And he uses uh, the Moore's curve, which kind of explains that you have the early adopters, you have uh, the common users, and then you have the laggards. So I think in Malcolm Gladwell's tipping point, he kind of talks about this too. At what point does uh, an idea spread and become uh, commonplace? And he uses the example of Advil. Which, uh, if you were to try to make a new pain reliever Advil today, you, you'd probably have a tough time. Even if you had an infinite budget, um, you'd have a hard time finding people that would want to switch over from current Advil, Ibuprofen, all of these well-known brands over to your product. Um, so you'd have to find them right at the right time that they aren't happy with their current product and want to make the jump. And then the second thing that you'd have a hard time with is finding someone that would just listen. Today we live in uh, you know the attention economy where... Getting someone's attention is so challenging if you do it through the common means. Uh, I, I hear very famously, like if you have commercials running on your television, what's the first thing that your customers are going to do? Look down at their phone and kind of tune out or do the things that they want to do. Look at, look at the screen and control the action how they want to. We already talked about being first. It makes it a lot easier because there's less competition. So if you're the first Advil pill, man, uh, he talks about in the early days of that where, um, you know, it was a big need that a lot of people have. A little bit of pain. Here's this thing that you can take. Alleviates it. Boom. Wonder pill. Literally wonder pill at that time. Uh, today's world, we have a lot more choices um, and people have a lot less time to make uh, decisions. People are so busy, and so really trying to convert, get customers is, you know, we, we have more ways of accessing people, but getting that attention, getting people to take action is, is more challenging. He talks about the common cycle that uh, brands used to take was uh, they would buy ads, they would get more distribution, sell more products, make a profit, and then, um, you know, buy ads and keep doing the whole cycle all over again. And he uh, talks about kind of TV commercials, the TV, I don't know if he is quite TV industrial complex, but pretty much that all you had to do is uh, pump in a lot of um, advertisements into your commercials. The, a lot of companies perfected the way of the commercials. One of the brands that he mentions is Procter & Gamble uh, as one prime example. And uh, yeah, pretty much consumers are hard to reach because they ignore you. So, you know, people have seen so many commercials over the years. And I know there's the iconic, uh, you know, Super Bowl commercials all over the years that were um, 
just so out there, so outlandish, but people couldn't remember what actually the commercial was about. Uh, one of the fun examples they use is the Captain Crunch story. And I didn't know this, that uh, Captain Crunch actually created their commercials and then the cereal came second. I don't know if you could quite do this today, maybe on a different kind of scale, but they wanted to implement in the minds of kids the captain and really building around his brand and his persona. And um, pretty much you were saying that it would be really hard to do that today because uh, kids won't listen, adults won't listen. Um, but, yeah, maybe someone can do it on social media. But that was cool. The advertising came before the cereal. <laughs> but it wound up working out for them. Uh, captain Crunch is pretty well known. It talks about some of the iconic uh, assets that ba brands have, such as Nintendo. They've been kind of milking the Mario and Zelda brands for many, many years, and they they are icons. You'll see them all over the place. They're part of our uh, culture. They're part of our history. Uh, they explain that the way that we market is getting less effective. Um, he actually uses an example of people that were reading the Wall Street Journal and there was big advertisements all on the front of the page and he asked them right after they flipped the page what, what was the advertisement and people still couldn't even remember that's how um, adverse to advertising or how much it just like we're able to see through it uh, as consumers so even it so kind of one of the things that they get into is spending a lot of your money on advertising might not be the best idea maybe making a more remarkable product standing out in other ways could be more benefit to your organization. Uh, he talks about, you know, create things that are worth talking about. What is a product that people want to talk about or is there something that stands out in your processes or ways that you do your work that makes want, other people want to share that information? He says invite your users to uh, make recommendations about your product. And then uh, most importantly, when you do start to make a profit, Reinvest it and create a new remarkable thing, a new remarkable purple cow, essentially. And he talks about, you know, selling to new users is tough. Uh, people are usually happy with what they have, and they largely ignore you because to adopt some kind of new process, to learn about something that just takes time and effort that not everyone has. Uh, and then he talks about spreading ideas, which is, um, and Seth Godin's one of his other books, The Unleashing the Idea Virus, which came out in 2000. Uh, kind of an interesting title today by today's um, pandemic standards, of, but talking about sneezing and having that be a spread and having that, um, just the way that people think and talk about your product, having that just go a lot further. A big thank you to our sponsors over at songtub.com. That's right, song or music and a tub, like a bath, but more fun to say, tub, tub. Anyway, you can check out Songtub's website for any of your music needs. In fact, the song playing in the background right now is from Songtub. So why pick them over anyone else? Well, they curate the music. And I know the guys, so that means I know that they're selecting great music for your project. A lot of other companies will brag about how many songs they have, maybe 100,000, 200,000, maybe even a million. But honestly, I don't have time for that. I don't have the time to just sit down and go, next, 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 a song, not so great. You know, trying to figure out where the best music is. Songtub.com, great place to get your music. And now I'm excited to offer you the first month for free if you go to songtub.com slash pro, P-R-O, and we have a promo code for you. Yes, that's right. My name, your host, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, and that will give you your first month free to have access to a huge music library that you can use towards your next video project, podcast, or any of your general audio needs. Anyway, back to the show. And then he explains that you don't really want to cater to the masses. You want to cater to the customers that choose you and that you want to have. Uh, essentially, it's a lot easier. This is kind of common sense, but it's a lot easier to sell to someone who's in the mood to buy than really trying to like pull that horse to water to make them make a decision. It's a lot easier for the consumer, and it's a lot easier for you if they're already kind of in that mindset. And again, talking about mass media, uh, consumers are just getting better at ignoring advertisements, and to really stand out from the crowd, you need to do something quite innovative 
and most companies don't really have the budget to do super extravagant things so you guys start thinking outside the box what are other ways that you can stand out um maybe a podcast could be something that you could do to stand out but that's becoming a little bit more saturated too um you don't need to make a product for everyone be specific and then hone in on what those needs are and um, he actually in fact says that being remarkable does not mean being liked by everyone We'll get into it a little bit later, but it talks about um, you know South Park. If South Park was trying to cater to everyone, it wouldn't stand out quite the way that it does. In fact, it was actually disliked by uh, I think they said by women. Um, it was like they gave it a 1.5 out of 10, which it like broke the records for most hated show. Uh, but for young boys, adolescents. They loved it, and it it definitely was a remarkable purple cow that people want to share with. So keep that in mind. I think that uh, for a lot of us, having someone to say no, rejecting it feels bad, so you want to try to cater to everyone. Um, and they also talk about this later. If you start catering to everyone, if you start creating your products by committee, uh, you're essentially creating a camel. Yeah, a camel was created by committee uh, as opposed to the horse. So um, just kind of a funny way of looking at it so um a lot of these things you have to kind of stick to your guts and you can't create things that are going to appeal to everyone and then he actually explains how um on being remarkable when times are tough brands will say we can't afford to be remarkable and then when times are good brands say hey no no let's relax we don't want to screw this up so that's why you see um some of those original brands that were on the stock market, I forget what the number is, like 10, 20% of them are still around. It's because they're not still choosing to be remarkable. He actually explains, you know, becoming okay with being widely criticized, which is something that I've actually faced with this podcast is like, you know, facing criticism or questions or what are you doing? What are you trying to accomplish here? Like, trying to pursue through those things and still maintain your vision and remember your why and continue doing things because they bring you, you know, fulfillment and you understand that they're going to, you know, ultimately help you stand out. Because it, when you're standing out, when you're doing something different, you're going to get some pushback. You're going to get some, uh, you know, maybe some interesting glances from people. You know, those are, that's how you know you're doing the right things. <laughs> He uses examples of uh, Bob Dylan when he went from acoustic to electric. It really made a lot of people mad, uh, but it wound up being the right choice. Um, they talk about Cadillac for changing their look. Uh, they got a lot of criticism for that. And um, you know, at the end of the day, he talks about how usually those who are successful have had um, a lot of unsuccessful products or projects that they've worked on. So that's really what makes um, the people that are so successful that much more awesome is that you know that they had to grind their way through all these really tough um, projects leading up to how they got their sex success today. They were able to pursue and keep trying in spite of their failures. So I essentially figure out what's working and keep doing more of it. He uses a couple more examples. He talks about how you know Logitech, they create um, you know technology accessories. I think I know most for their headsets, and he explains how um, they're not actually like the most cutting edge on the technology side, but they understood that they weren't just a technology company trying to provide the best microphones or auditory experience, but it has a look to it and a feel. And so, um, keeping the end user in mind with your products is essential. And he actually even talks about Pearl Jam, a band out of the Northwest, and how uh, their model was actually to not do the mainstream thing, which is try to produce hit after hit after hit. They had their first album, and then I think they released a whole bunch of live versions of that album, and they just they already had their audience, and they just wanted to maintain that audience and um, have them to spread the idea through word of mouth, tell their friends and their family about their band, but they didn't want to try to, you know, do the really tough model of, okay, we need to create a, a, a super hit every two to three years, which is just, how do you do that? That's, that's just not possible. And they, they just kick that idea aside completely 
honed in and kind of created um, this like little cult following of people that love their music and are willing to go see them live and just follow them. So kind of cool models, kind of shifting the way that we think about things, which is the mainstream trying to, you know, create something viral all the time. How about you just hone in on that specific audience? How far in the niche can you go and then cater to that specific needs? And um, once you've had success there, create more purple cows. He uh, explains, can you create a collectible version of your product? So that was one of the questions that they had. Um, there is also a word, a Japanese word, word called otaku, which is pretty much the followers that you want to create. It's someone who sees whatever your product is or your service as more than just a hobby, but less than an obsession. So it's kind of in that sweet spot of, hey, they're passionate about your product and they are willing to, you know, they're interested and they're satisfied with it. One of the other examples is uh, Dutch Boy paint cans, which they're like, why do we need to make our paint cans this like cumbersome, you know, heavy metal, tough to open top? Uh, they actually changed the game, made it a screw top, and it wound up, you know, for them just asking themselves, why do we need to always do this? Because they were able to change their processes, I think they saved money on the containers, saved money on shipping costs, and it was really because someone said, hey, why can't we do this? And it's a lot of, that's probably one of my favorite things is uh, always asking yourself, why not? Why not? Can we push this more? He talks about Krispy Kreme, which, uh, yeah, if this was 2002, I remember there was a massive buzz around Krispy Kreme. Like, hey, when's it going to come to my town? And, uh, yeah, people would wait for hours just to get a box of, of these dozen. A lot of them, I think, were just the same type of glazed donut. And you didn't get the variety pack. They just did a very good glazed donut packed with sugar. But that was part of the appeal, part of the lure, and you would tell your friends. And I think at the beginning they would give away thousands of these donuts and that would get people pretty hooked and start the buzz going. Uh, if you're getting anything from this podcast, it's that, that building up that buzz and that ex, you know excitement, things that people, what is something that someone would tell their friends without even you having to ask them to tell them that they would just go ahead and do? So, uh, you know, Godin's strategy is in your pur creating your purple cow is identify the edges of your industry and test the ones that have the best chance of success and go there. Where, how can you live on the edges? How can you live on the fringe? And he uses JetBlue as an example that they were, um, you know, finding the edge of service and pricing. Now, a lot of people can do that in the early stages of their business, keep prices low, but maybe you can provide a really good um, experience for your customers and um, just change the way that people do things. I think people always just really enjoy innovation too, something that's outside the box, something that's different. Uh, that's, that's really what people in society are always looking for, something new, what's the next big thing? And he talks about uh, it's important to have a slogan. Having a slogan for your product allows people to easier explain or more easily explain what your product is, what it does. So his example is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's a lot easier to explain the Leaning Tower of Pisa than the Partheon. Even though the Partheon is this beautiful structure, uh, something about a structure leaning sells out way more. And I think it's because it's easy to wrap your head around and the slogan is built within the name. And that's kind of what he explains is that you want to kind of build in the, the the marketing should be built into the product. If you guys remember the Mad Men episode we did a few weeks ago, you know, with the tobacco products, there's an iconic scene in the show where they are having a hard time selling the tobacco. And so Don Draper asked, well, you know, explain to me what's the process? What are some of the things you do? And one of the things that they did was they smoke the tobacco. So it's like smoky tobacco. I don't know. It's I guess it's a, a smoking product, but that was one way that they could leverage that the product was unique is that they, they it smoked tobacco. So that's something that you know if you can identify the different processes or one of the unique wow factors of your business or your product, um, you can hone in on that and leverage it. And we've talked about in twenty two immutable laws. There is um, what was it? Shell oil. 
they added something into their oil that everyone is required to, but then they said, no, this is our selling point. This is what differentiates us. So go ahead, review things, and see what can make you stand out. And then he talks about the cycle of the cow, kind of how the, it goes about, is that you want to first alert your fans of a new purple cow, whether you do this through e email, social media, um, advertising on television, any number of things. And you want to make it really easy for those early adopters to share it with their friends. Um, is there a share button? Is there a slogan that they can say? Do you have a pamphlet or brochure? How can people get the word out about your product for you? And then once you've made a profit, let someone else run all of that, then reinvest and create a new purple cow. And he says, plan for failure. Um, it's really hard to create a purple cow, so plan for failure. So maybe create you know, five, ten different things, see how they work, and just determine how you can be remarkable and stand out. Um, he explains that you know customers need a permission outlet. So having an email address that people can write to, if you have a physical store, do you have a Dropbox that people can put their questions or their concerns and then follow up with them? Have that conversation. For me, uh, this podcast is part of that. So if you guys have any comments, you know, put them into uh, the on YouTube. Put them in the notes. If you're on um, Apple or Spotify, leaving a review can be really helpful for us as well. A cactus knows how to survive. It can endure scorching heat, limited rainfall, and defends itself against critters daily. Your business is no different. To survive harsh conditions, it's important to develop deep roots using media content that'll continuously nourish and support your marketing efforts day after day. Cactus Media is here to help you determine a strategy and create media content. Together, let's map out the next sequence of videos, podcasts, and social media to help your business thrive. Work with Tactus Media, media tactics that stick. Ouch! Visit tactusmedia.com to learn more. So he explains how marketing used to just be synonymous with advertising, but today marketers should be looking at the entire lifespan of the product. So marketers should have a hand in the inventing of the product, the design of the product. He really heavily talks about the design, how important that is, um, the production aspect, the pricing and selling techniques that go along with the product. So thinking about every stage and how can you create a really good customer experience. Uh, he explains... I don't know if this is just something within his own like kind of personal quarrel with it, but he says when a company is not doing well, it's because the senior management is uh, running a company and not marketing a product. It's going to be really true. You know, People start to rest on their laurels, and they start to do the same things, and they just kind of manage people, but they don't think about, hey, who's the end consumer, and how can we make an innovative experience every single time? He talks about one of the good techniques that you can have as a marketer is projecting. So can you get in the heads of your customers? Um, who cares about the product? You know, Who are the different groups? And the more different customers that you can get in the mind of, the more successful you're going to have. Um, he said this is a good discipline for when you're launching products is to watch, measure, learn, and do it over and over again. And it really helps if you're passionate about the product. Um, he uses Patagonia as an example. A lot of the people that work at Patagonia are probably going to go out and go surfing on the weekend or they're going to go uh, rock climbing. These are all very adventurous things, so they're going to be able to spot the products that are doing well and give you that feedback. And then he does make the distinction between um, out being outrageous and being remarkable. And he uses Ozzy Osbourne and Hooters as two examples of um, brands that are a little bit outrageous, but it w plays into their remarkability. Wouldn't maybe work for everybody, but it allows you to stand out and, and stick. And so he explains that good marketing is rewiring the way that you think about your product. Um, so what would you do if you could do anything? And many people think that uh, for a business to succeed, they need to spend more money on advertising. They need to have more layoffs, you know, cut back on costs. But for him, it's all. But Seth Godin explains that 
It's about creating the optimal customer experience. You know, for Best Buy, the customer feedback was to do things a little bit more of the hard way, but they chose to listen to the customer, and it wound up being the right path forward. And he explains that actually they would they save so much more money than they would have spent on advertising by focusing on processes and reworking the experience for the customer, and they had that much more success. So can you do something that feels very personalized to your customer? Can you give them something unique? He talks about Hallmark and Starbucks. They both have their reward systems. The uh, the Hallmark gold crown, so you're always trying to figure out how can I get those extra points to be able to cash in on prizes, similar to Starbucks, which you know the more you spend with them, the more Starbucks you get that you can spend. Genius, and I know people really go out of their way to uh, get those. Um, some other ways that you can be remarkable is maybe you have a danger factor to your product. So unfiltered cigarettes or high proof alcohol, these all have an allure factor. Um, can you do something that creates buzz? For example, the lottery, as that, that number gets bigger and bigger, um, a lot of people start to get really excited. Even though the odds of you winning go dramatically down, there's something about seeing that big number and the possibilities that creates buzz you know hey did you hear that the lottery is up to you know 100 million this year wow like those are things that people talk about uh and so he said that the ways that brands used to get prominence so these are the old ways of doing it so you'll have to think of ways to you know out of the box you know i've given a few examples but the ways that brands used to do things was you had uh you know tv advertising word of mouth some made it by print advertising, and then some made it by bullying or acquiring other companies. Today, you'll have to do it much different, and in the future, you'll have to do it much more different than that. That's just how it goes. So today, starting with going where the comp competition is not out, not at. The further out you can go, the better you can do. So can you be the most at something? Can Well, you probably can't be the oldest, but can you be like the newest or the loudest? or the funniest. These are all different you know, adjectives that you can stand out with your brand. So some of the suggestions that he makes, some of the homework that you can do, these are the call to actions, is make a list of 10 ways to make your product uh, appeal more to a select group in your market. So really you know, niching down into like one or specific group of people that like your product, what are 10 ways that you can make it appeal more to them? Um, and then Something that you can do to for inspiration is look at a industry that is more dull than your own and then see who's remarkable in it. Can you kind of copy their style? Can you use them as inspiration for your own brand? Yeah, don't actually copy, but use it as inspiration and figure out what it is that allowed them to stand out. And then ask yourself why not. Ask yourself why not about the product. Ask yourself why not about the processes. Keep pushing that envelope. So at the end of the day, this book was um, definitely highly recommended. I only gave you kind of an overview. So it, go out, get this book. Um, it's a very classic in the marketing world. Feel free to share it with other people. Um, I love how at the very end he actually explains how, you know, a lot of these changes are going to be hard to, like, even if you go to your marketing department at your big organization and tell them, hey, I just read this book, like, we should be doing things differently, we should try to be remarkable, you're probably going to have a lot of pushback, which I get from from a lot of the marketing books I read at the end. They're like, you know, these are really good things, but uh, to try to make these changes within a big matrix organization, you're going to have a tough time. So, um, yeah, take that as you will. But for a lot of the people that are listening to this podcast, I believe, uh, you know, small business owners, these are some of the things that you can start doing today, and you really do have a lot of a pull in the direction of your organization. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, how can you stand out? How can you be a purple cow? Um, yeah, until next time, I hope you guys have enjoyed this. This has been my uh, book analysis of Purple Cow by Seth Godin. All right, until next time, always hit the mark. Thanks for tuning in to Vidmark, a place for all your video marketing needs. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite platform and tune in every Thursday morning on either iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and more. For a behind the scenes look and some bonus tips, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Until next time, good luck with your video marketing efforts, and remember, always hit the mark.